if you were here on last Sunday, you had a chance to hear Lady Fred begin this message entitled Falling In and Staying In. If you were not here, I'm sorry, you're lost. But if you are not here, see those brothers in the media room, and they'll help you out and see if they could hook you up with a copy or something. We started the time of sharing on Sunday with this statement. I'm not sure if you remember it. The statement was a quote from Pastor Andy Stanley, and he stated, falling in requires a pulse. Falling in love requires a pulse. Staying in love requires a plan. Falling in love requires a pulse. Staying in love requires a plan. And we began to talk a little bit about what that plan really has to entail. If we don't have this plan in place, our reality is we are in trouble. And today what we're going to do is we're going to continue this conversation. And we're going to continue it really spending some time talking and sharing about uh, emotional baggage and conflict resolution. Praise the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, Restoration. Good morning. So we're going to start our t time of sharing with uh, a story. So um, maybe two years in? No, it wasn't. Yeah, two years in. Two, three years in into our uh, marriage. At that time, we lived in Stoughton. We had already moved in to Brockton, so about two, three years. PM and I had a heated argument. And the argument was based on a spoon. <laughs> and you've, I think you've heard PM's version of that story. Now you're gonna hear the real version of I'll the story. I'll correct her <laughs> where she slips up. So, um, one night, Pastor Manny, we love cereal. I don't know. It's a comfort um, food. So we love eating cereal at home. And um, sitting downstairs in the kitchen, and Pastor Manny, you know, pours a bowl of cereal, puts his milk, and he opens, and he grabs a spoon from the good spoon. She's not telling this right, y'all. So... So let's be real here. So I grew up in an in a impoverished background. And as a result, what we had in my household growing up were teaspoons. We didn't have tablespoons, right? So I don't know if we was too poor. I don't know what happened. Maybe they ate the, I don't know what they did with the tablespoons, but we had teaspoons. So I'm accustomed to eating my cereal with teaspoons. It's not proper to not have your cereal with a teaspoon. And so I get home and, you know, it's late and, you know, I'm trying to just eat something real light and I'm going to have me a bowl of cereal and there are no tablespoons available. Teaspoons. Yes, ma'am. No <laughs> teaspoons available. No teaspoons available. And, and, and that's he goes criminal. in my good spoon draw. Continue. Carry on. Yes. That's, that's broken the law. That's breaking the law. So I, 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 I look at him and I'm like, brother, why, why are you getting spoons from... And then he tells me this story about his impoverished childhood that I really did not care about. He just took my good spoon. The truth is coming out, y'all. You see that? So I said to him, there are other spoons that you can use. They're not teaspoons, but you can use them. So Pastor Manny proceed, proceeded to tell me that his mouth was too small <laughs> for the tablespoon. So we're sitting there at it, and he's like, my mouth is too small for this. I was like, Manny, so I grab a big... Cooking spoon. cooking spoon. And I said, this spoon can fit in your mouth. 
talking about this is too, my mouth is too small. So we get into it. And we sit in there and we going back and forth, back and forth. And he's like, I'm the man of this house and I will eat with this spoon. And I was like, and I purchased the spoons. The man is going to tell me he's the man, but I purchased them. So we're going back and forth and we're going back and forth. And I just stopped. And I said, we are arguing over a spoon, Manny. Over a spoon. Eat it. Eat it. So he's like, yes, I won this battle. <laughs> so after he's eating his cereal, he comes upstairs and he's like, what was that about? Was it about the spoon? Or was it so much more? See, the truth is, we argue as couples, we argue. However, the reason for the argument is never what we argue about. It was a spoon. Did it really matter? I could have washed it. But so much came out of it because Pastor Manny said, I'm the man. Preach. So what did... The, what did that mean? What, what did it mean? He felt as though my saying he couldn't do it affected his manhood. Undermined it. Un undermined it, yeah. And that's what we call emotional baggage. Fred, on the other hand, felt as if my disregarding uh, her rule really meant that I didn't care for what was important to her. And it wasn't about a spoon, rather it was really about am I valued, prioritized by Manny? And so this spoon ends up becoming about a whole lot more than a spoon. I'm not sure if you've ever had a fight or an argument with someone that you care about, whether it's a spouse or a friend or a sibling, and y'all are fighting over something frivolous and then you realize that it's so much deeper than what this thing was about. I mean, I got some folks here who, who've ever been there. Amen. And if you're not saying amen, you are lying. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So what this ended up scratch, scratching the surface of was really some of the emotional baggage that we both carried into the relationship. I'm just going to invite you to say this with me. I got baggage. I got baggage. Okay, now I want you to turn to someone next to you and say, you got baggage. <laughs> now let's say this together. We got baggage. You got baggage. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, baggage come from the way you were brought up. And so, um, I, I was looking for it, but I could not find it. I was telling Pastor Manny about this research that I, that I looked, um, that I read, a few, few months back, but I thought it was so profound. It said that in order to have, to, to have a good or strong relationship, strong marriage, you have to have a um, few things. You need to be brought up in a home with two secured parents, right? You have to have your mom, you have your, your dad that have a secured relationship then you have to be secured in that home and you need, to be, uh, you need to be told all the time how great you are. So emotionally, you need to be built up. Then on top of that, so you have to have a secure, you have to have both parents in the home. You, they have to have a secured relationship. Then they got to tell you how awesome you are all the time. Then 
um, they need to deal, any, any emotional issue that you have, anything that you brought up, they need to sit down and talk to you about every single thing. How many people in this room had all that growing up? So does that mean that you cannot have a strong relationship? So. I love this slide because it gives you a sense of some of the baggage that we carry. Grief, insecurity, pain, bitterness, anger, abuse, depression, uh, loss. And the list could be expanded upon even more, right? Uh, rejection, big one that a lot of men seem to carry. Uh, and again, we come in with this emotional baggage and if left unaddressed, what does it result in? Not just conflict, but heightened, increased conflict. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in Luke 6, 45, it says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. For the heart speaks what the heart is. The mouth speaks from what the heart is full of. So we're going to go into this. So I have a little demonstration. demonstration. So this is Mr. and Mrs. Mug. Say hello, Mr. and Mrs. Mug. Mr. Simon Mug and Mrs. Simon Mug. Right? So, Mr. Simon and Mrs. Simon, you know, they go, they meet each other, hello. They, you know, they have a great relationship. Oh, Miss Mustache went away. It fell. Oh, okay. But, anyways, so they meet and they have a great relationship. They go, they get married. And now they're living this perfect life, and they're going to live this happily ever after life, right? Following? So Mr. Mug and Mrs. Mug get into a fight. And they're arguing. They're arguing. They're arguing. So Mr. Mug gets upset, right? Why does he get upset? He says, Mrs. Mug, because she collided with me, had me, had my green marbles fall. So Mr. Mug is blaming Mrs. Mug for his green marble, mar marbles falling out. And Mrs. Mug is arguing with Mr. Mar Mug for her purple marbles falling out. Where the truth of the matter is, they both have marbles. Marbles do not come out of nothing. The marbles, the green marbles, belong to Mr. Mug. The purple marbles belong to Mrs. Mug. So what we do as, couple, as couples, we blame each other for the marbles. After the fullness of your heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in you is what comes out of you. Get it? So if anger is spilling out onto Mrs. Mug, is it Mrs. Mug's fault? If insecurity, jealousy, low self-esteem, all of that is spilling onto Mr. Mug, is it Mr. Mug's fault? It is not. So whatever is in you comes out of you. So now I want you to repeat with me. Whatever is in me, whatever's in me, will come out of me. Will come out of me. Now, is it hopeless 
that I have green marbles, that Manny has green marbles, and that I have purple marbles. No. Why not? Because we all have marbles. Remember, in order to have this perfect relationship, you need to come out of a perfect home. But we've already established that there's no such thing as a perfect home. So now what we need to be aware of are the marbles. We need to be able to name our marbles. So I have insecurity issues. I have low self-esteem issues. I have, and we keep going on and on and on. So once you are aware of what your marbles are, what do you do? You work on them. You dress the marbles. If I get angry, if Pastor Manny got angry over the spoon, it wasn't the spoon. It wasn't the fact that Fred said no to the spoon that made him angry. It was the fact that somewhere, way back when, he felt unheard. unheard. He felt as though his opinion didn't matter. Whatever caused that spilled out of them. And me, I didn't have that many marbles, so nothing spilled out. <laughs> no. <laughs> but my marbles spilled out based on the fact that I need to feel respected. I need to feel like I have a voice. And so I kept arguing over the fact that I was not being heard. And I felt disrespected. so interesting. What makes it so interesting is a lot of times we get into these arguments and at the core of it are these unmet core needs that we have that Fred felt disrespected, right? So did I. We felt this, we both felt disrespected in the, over the course of this argument. And what it boiled down to was we just weren't able to really talk through with respect, honor, and love through the situation that was before us because there were these underlying marbles that we hadn't dealt with. These underlying marbles that continued to really be prodded and hit up over the course of time because we've never addressed them. How many of you have got stuff that you've just buried beneath the surface, but if you're honest with yourself, that stuff resurfaces continually in different ways and shapes or forms. Baggage must be dealt with. While out of our Luke, um, Luke, Luke six. six, our Luke six passage finds some root in this next slide. Proverbs 4 and 23. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from it. It's an interesting picture here with the heart on lock. That's this idea of guard your heart. If our heart isn't guarded, what do we do? We incur more and more baggage, right? We incur more and more hurt and pain and loss that then spills out of stuff. Amen. Particularly when we get into anything that seems to irritate that sore spot in our heart. Also, we find ourselves doing things and not even being aware of the fact that we have exposed our hearts and so the environment that we put ourselves in the things that we watch the things that we allow in our spirit also affect the heart pm and i were talking about that we said you know sometimes and men men you need to be aware you need to be watchful of what you are seeing but it, but because it's an open gate, it brings, it leads it right to your spirit, it leads it right to your heart. And so uh, we find men that are struggling with pornography, that really affects the marriage. Right. Because now 
you get married and you think you're married to a porn star. And the expectation is what you see because your heart, that is what's in you. And so you expect that. And so you find yourself colliding and spilling over because you have an expectation that is not being met. Why? Because you didn't guard your heart. Same goes with women. The people that you allow to speak into your life You have to be mindful of that because the relationship is worth so much more. And so you find yourself, sometimes the husband will look at you like, who are you? Yes, Lord, yes. <laughs> who are you? Because I know I'm not talking to the person that I'm, that I'm married. And so guarding the heart is something that is, that is um, extremely important. Knowing what your marbles are, dealing with the marbles, and guarding your heart. Conflict is real in marriages and in relationships. Um, it's real because our heart has been left unguarded, and we've got baggage that we carry. And the minute anything looks like our sore spot, anything, the minute anything feels like the rejection you felt, uh, growing up or, or the hurt or disrespect you felt from a past relationship, all of a sudden, you know, your antenna goes up and your guard goes up because now you're, you're in defense mode when the truth is oftentimes it's not an attack that you're experiencing as you <coughs> feel it is. It's really simply your friend, your peer, your spouse expressing what it is that they're experiencing as they relate with you. <coughs> One of the things that's so important is coming to the place where we can say, okay, this conflict is real, but this conflict is because there are some unmet needs. How do we come to a place where we address this conflict appropriately? How do we do that? It's about uh, initially loving confrontation, loving confrontation. Confrontation, loving confrontation. When Fred and I first got married, uh, Fred used to say stuff like, you did this or you didn't do that. And you, and, and, and the way I would take the you did this or you didn't do that is, you loser, Manny, you are whack for not doing this. You suck at, right? And, and, and I took that so in such a kind of an accusatory way. And oftentimes, right, we, we speak and um, not the words that we say, but the tone in which we say it conveys so much more than actually the words do, right? So sometimes Fred be upset and all I would hear, truth be told, I'd hear no words, y'all. I'd hear womp, 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 womp. And his face looked right? it too. Like... And, and I'd be like, oh, here she go again. She's just yelling. Keep yelling. When you done, I'll talk. Right, and 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 I totally just kind of er, cut it out because I'm not even hearing at that point. Why? Because there's this basic, basic respect in terms of approach that we need to to utilize when we're confronting each other. And so, loving confrontation has to be the way in which we approach each other when conflict arises. What that means also is there are times when you're upset that you ain't got no business talking because you upset. Oh, y'all don't got to say amen, um, but it's true. Because you're upset, you're going to say some things that you will regret. Amen. So you are better off saying, um, let's talk about this after I've had a chance to cool down because I don't want to say something that I don't really mean. And it's my heart speaking rather than my heart speaking. Mm -hmm. Do you want to chime in? Um, PM is so right about the you statement versus, versus the I statement. Um, and when I became aware of the fact that he was just hearing his, I don't know where he was, he was hearing something completely different. I remember one day saying, like, he's so hurt. I was like, dude, it's not that serious. And I said, 
what did you hear me say? And he went on into a, you know, you've heard, you said to me that I was, uh, I, uh, what, did he, what did he say? Something to the effect of him not being a provider, not this and that. And I'm like, are we speaking the same language? It feels that way because we're not speaking the same language. Because he's, he's hearing my, the hurt and not the heart. So a lot of time, and it, it, it's not belittling the other person. Communication, in order to communicate, you have to be able to understand what the other person is hearing as well. I can say something to you and say, okay, okay, PM, I, I'm telling you something right now in secrecy right now. You can't say it. I need you to go to Sister Cat. Say the exact same thing that I said to you to Sister Cat. Sister Cat, you go say it to, to, to Cindy. Cindy, by the time it gets to, it has changed completely. Because you put your own perspective into that conversation. And so someone's perspective is their reality. So being aware of A, are you hearing what I'm saying? And not being offended by the fact that the person did not hear what you were saying. It's slowing down and saying, no, that's not what I meant. When preparing to confront, I, I pray that y'all are taking some notes here. Um, we're being transparent because we want to strengthen relationships. And I think it's the only way we grow as a family. Loving confrontation is how you address conflict. When preparing to confront, spend time in prayer. Let me say that again. When preparing to confront, spend time in prayer. When preparing to confront, spend time in prayer. Check your motives also. Mm -hmm. Why is it I'm confronting? Am I confronting my spouse or my friend so I can be right? Because this is about me being right and or proving. Or feel better. Or, or so that I can yeah. get my point across right. and get it off my chest. Right? There always has to be this unified goal of oneness. Oneness, where we're one. Two became one. Right? Whether it's uh, uh, our marital relationship or those that you're in relationship with, friendships with. Right? The goal is that you're together. And it's not about being right. It's about being together. Spend time in prayer. Check your motives. Choose your timing wisely. Choose your timing wisely. Like, we could share stories on all of these things, right? But for the sake of time, we're going to try to move on. But uh, spend time in prayer. Check your motives. Choose your timing wisely. The next thing we want to address as it relates to how do we appropriately address conflict, first, loving confrontation. But the next thing is forgiveness, 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 forgiveness. There are a number of hindrances to forgiveness. Because you're hurt, it's oftentimes difficult to let go of that hurt. Sometimes, you're running back and forth with your spouse and your friend, and y'all don't got and make you don't make the time to actually communicate and request and ask for earnest forgiveness. Um, sometimes we're just proud and prideful. Y'all don't gotta say amen, <laughs> but it's real. Sometimes we come at stuff with like, "Yo, I, I don't want to lower myself, humble myself." To her, and then you're in this argument, right? And then you're in the argument, and you're not even listening to what's being said because there's pride welling up in you. You're listening for a mistake uttered from your spouse so that you can hop on the mistake. Okay, none of y'all are honest up in here, right? Maybe not you, but I've been guilty of that. Well, I don't even hear what she's saying. I'm just listening for her slip up so I can be like, ha ha, yeah, you was wrong right there on that one point. And I missed the whole thing. Why? Pride. Because I'm not looking to humble myself and be one in those circumstances. 
What I'm trying to do is be right and win the fight. And I win the fight and I lose the war. So many of us are bent on winning a fight that we're failing to recognize that we're actually losing the war. Losing the war. We spoke about last week about the fact that you can be right. And I could hear all the stories about how white you are. And I would probably agree with the fact that you were right in that situation. However, there will, not, will never be relationship if you stuck in your own self-righteousness. Relationship, in order to relate and have, uh, have a strong relationship, you have to be able to see the other person's perspective. And sometimes you have to learn to let it go. You are not, you have to be willing not to lose some, bat, some, some battles. And it's okay. Because we also spoke about the fact that we take our cues from Jesus. And if Jesus was bent on telling us how wrong we were, we would never have a relationship with him. How do you go about in requesting and gaining forgiveness? This slide, I think, really gives some concrete steps. And I pray we at least take a look at this. The very first thing is be specific. I'm sorry for blank. Um, not just I'm sorry. What you sorry for? Right? Amen. Amen. Be specific. Repent. I was wrong and don't want to do that again. Amen. Repentance means I'm making a U-turn and I'm not going back to where I was at before. I was wrong and I do not want to do that again. You are human. You are fallen. You might slip up again. But if you earnestly repent, what you're saying is I don't want to go back there. It's not worth going back there. I'd much rather honor you. And then ask. Specifically ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. And the truth is, you got to be willing to accept responsibility as well for what has transpired. Set your spouses free from the debt of the offense. When you ask for forgiveness or grant forgiveness, you know what that means? That means you do not continue to hold that offense against them. That means, couples here, please hear me. It means... You addressed it. You've dealt with it. You don't have the right three weeks later to bring that thing back up or three months later or three years later. Amen. 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 Forgiveness means I've released that right, that offense, that debt, and I am no longer counting that thing against my spouse. Hard, particularly when your spouse hurt you in a way that was hard and deep and profound. Sometimes you can't forgive on your own. You might want to, but you need Jesus's help to yes. forgive. <laughs> Amen. That's why prayer, all of this always starts with prayer. There's a slide that steps to forgiveness we're not even going to go into, um, but please take a look at that. What we want to share in uh, closing is a place where we've been, and I'm actually going to let you share a little bit of this, and I'll chime in. So a few years ago, Pastor Manny became pastor, and it it changed a lot as expected. Um, I struggled with it a lot because I felt like, and I was right, he spent a lot of time just thinking, breathing, dreaming about church. And I struggled because I felt like, first off, me being upset about it made me less less in front of God. Like, okay, I'm hurting God in some type of way. I'm disappointing God, I should say. 
And I struggle internally, like, Lord, why do I feel this way? But I just couldn't shake it. I just felt like he didn't have his priority right. And first off, I needed to deal with my own why. Remember dealing with your marbles? Why do I feel this way? So I needed to feel, first off, I needed to deal with the fact that I felt um, as though I was disappointing God for just feeling that way. And secondly, um, deal, with the, we'll deal with the why I felt that way. Then that created a distance because I couldn't really share with him why I felt that way because I just really didn't know why. Um, and I just really didn't want him to feel as though I wasn't supporting him in a, way, in, a, in a way that I needed to support him. I wasn't the pastoral wife, if you will. So it took a while for me to deal with my own emotions and really talking to God and realizing that it's okay um, to feel the way I felt, um, that I wasn't hurting or disappointing God in any way, shape, or form, but I needed to talk to him because it created a, 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 a big, a, a big, yeah, a big riff, and we, we just... We couldn't talk. It was very superficial. I mean, we spoke, but we couldn't. We both knew there was something that I wasn't um, able to talk about. So we were, it, it, when we finally, it was two years ago. It was two years ago where we, so it's been four years. So it took two years for me to be at a place where I could name my emotions and name my feelings and be able to talk to him about it. But when we, it wasn't a talk, it was a big blow up. So it was like I dropped a bomb about how I was feeling and how, remember the you, 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 you. And it didn't come out how I planned it to, but it just came out. So I was like, there, deal with it. It's all out. And um, for him, being the pastor and the leader of his family felt like a failure. I, you know, and he was just disappointed in me. Like, dude, you're supposed to be my, you know, my backup person, my backbone, and you're just upset with me. Do you not know this is who I am? I'm like, no, y'all, Manny. This is who I married. I married Manny. I married the man. This is who I want. I don't want to go to bed with the pastor. Sorry. So we went and spoke to a dear couple that just ministered life into our situation just because we couldn't come to a common ground because, like, I was crying. Like, when it came out, I just couldn't pull it back in anymore. It was just out. And um, that, that couple just really ministered life to us and, I'm going to go a little bit deeper than Fred. <laughs> Truth is, uh, anyone involved in ministry knows that ministry takes a toll. Uh, and if you're in pastoral ministry, particularly early on, uh, you end up breathing, living, uh, dreaming ministry. You're always thinking about what you didn't get to because you've got to get to. And the truth is, I did poorly at kind of leaving ministry at church and then going home to my family and my wife. And what ended up happening was it caused us to drift and drift. And we knew that there was some tension and we were drifting, but we couldn't uh, really deal with it or talk about it without being short and cut and hurtful to each other because... This is my call, and also because it's my call, it's my wife's call, yet it's different. It's hard, and it becomes not just a call, life, right? And if we don't do life right, what do we deal with? We deal with the consequences thereof, and that was really where we were at. Um, you know, I uh, kind of went to school. I got some degrees, and then I you know, uh, left the job to do ministry full time because that was the call. And uh, 
it came at a financial sacrifice. Uh, and, and that was a part of it for Fred. You know, a part of it for Fred was like, dude, where, where's my best friend? Where are you, dude? You're, you're like, when you talk to me, you're talking to me about church. Yeah, I don't care. It was care. like, we cuddle, <laughs> and then this person said to me, and I'm like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I just want to talk to you. And, and it, it, it did have a financial impact yeah. where I just worked. I felt like I, it was unfair. All I did was work. I was pulling 90 hours a week, and... It was just unfair, I felt, in my mind. And we came to this place where it was like, okay, God, what do we do here? What do we do? Fred said her peace, and I felt like a failure as a pastor since, you know, this is my first ministry's home, right? So I felt like I was failing at home, and uh, church had its challenges as well. And we had to come to this place where we can either sit here and sulk and cry or we can really go before the Lord in prayer and really seek out some help. I want to share something with you. If you're in a covenant committed relationship, there is never any shame in seeking out help. Pride will tell you, you can't talk to no counselor or no pastor or whatever. But we all need help because we all got baggage. You might be in a relationship now where the truth is you haven't been fully transparent with your wife or your husband in ages. Why? Because you're not willing to lovingly confront and deal with some of the baggage that's impacting your marriage. And so what we, wanna, what we wanted to share with you today was what really came out of that time for us. Um, Lady Fred and I, as a result of that season in life, uh, we actually took a look at each other and said, we really want to rededicate our lives to each other. And so um, we did a vow renewal service, just her and I. Um, and we asked our counselor who was working this through with us, who's a pastor, to, 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 to officiate our vow renewal service. And I want to share with you what I shared with her on that day. When we got married in our 20s, we were incredibly well-intentioned. We had prayed and fasted and knew that God wanted us together, but we were also both really young and clueless as to what it really means to love biblically and live out that love in a way that honors God. So we made vows that we definitely did not fully understand, and in good faith, we tried to live them out to the best of our ability. However, today marks a new chapter in our journey, a day where we can press the reset button and then you start this journey with a deeper understanding of the profound gift of love and the requisite challenge poised to us, posed to us to live out his love to his glory. With that, please receive my vows. I vow to love you with all of my might, to cherish you above all others. I vow to prioritize you, your happiness and well-being always. I vow to commit to suffer long with kindness as it relates to you, to endure whatsoever may come and do it with a smile. I vow to proactively cover you spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, both privately and publicly. I vow to honor you and value all that you do. I vow to listen to you always and commit to understanding your perspectives upon matters. I vow to care for our children and work towards being a model that leaves a rich legacy both spiritually and financially, for our children's children. I vow to grow into the man that you see me as, or once saw me as, and are committing to push me into becoming. I vow to be the husband that you deserve. Yes. And he has it in his closet. He has it. So it's a reminder. This is taped up in my closet. Yes. Keep him. Hold them up to that. And so I did the same thing. I, I, I wrote my vows to him. So, so I said, Manny, my love, 
my best friend. The time of recommitting has come, and in the secret places of my heart, I meditate on my love for you. Today, before the Lord and our friends, I recommit myself to you. I accept you as my captain, my covering, God's special gift for me. I take you as you are, loving you, loving who you are now and who you have yet to become. I recommit to being your helper. I promise to listen to you and learn from you, to support you and accept your support. I will celebrate your triumphs and mourn your losses as though they were my own. I vow to work with you to foster and cherish a godly relationship, knowing that together we we will build a life far better than e far better far better than either of us could imagine alone. I will seek to open to be open and honest with you, to forgive you as Christ has forgiven me, and to always remind you of the Lord's plans and promises. I vow to choose you every day, to love you in word and, and in deed, to do the hard work of making now into always, to laugh with you, cry with you, grow with you, and create with you, to be your kin and your partner in all life's adventures, loving what I know of you and trusting what I don't know yet, what I don't yet know. I give you my hand, I give you my love, I give you myself. I vow to oversee the affairs of our family and by God's grace, create a household filled with laughter, patience, understanding, financial security, and most importantly, love. I pray for the wisdom to, to teach our daughters to be God-fearing young ladies, to be strong and courageous, disciplined and trustworthy, to be leaders, yet have a servant's heart. I pray also that our son can learn how he is to be loved by an, and how he is to be loved and honored by his future wife, by the way I love and honor you, by committing myself to a higher standard standard of devotion to God, to you, to our household. We will have a high. We will have a high standard. Manny, wear me as a seal upon your heart, for my love is infinitely strong. Many waters cannot quench it. No flood can sweep it away. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. I bask beneath your banner in the splendor of your love, for you are mine and your beloved is yours. We've gone a little long today, but we've done so really with one thing in mind. Our reality is we are far from perfect, very far from perfect. But what God has called us to do in every area of life is to love. And love is hard work. It's hard. But here is God's challenge to you. If you would love as Christ loved, what you'll discover is that his spirit then empowers you to do what you feel sometimes you can't even do. If we commit to loving each other, our spouses, in the way in which God has called us to, what we discover is these vows, these promises, these pledges that sometimes feel unattainable the Spirit of God empowers us to live out. So today as we close, I want to challenge you. And I want to challenge every individual here. Whether you're engaged or married or dating or single, I want you to right now to begin to think about the commitment that the Lord would have for you to make as it relates to loving your peers your family members, your siblings, your spouse, your spouse-to-be. What does that entail? Are you really, really willing to step up and walk in this charge and this challenge to love? To love. To love. As you're thinking about this charge, 
We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Father, as we sit here today, what we know is that you've challenged us. Your word teaches us that we are to love our brothers and sisters, love our spouses, love even the stranger in the same way that you love us as our example. Lord, this challenge is hard, particularly given that we all come with so much baggage to the table. Lord, even now, it's my prayer that you might help us to live out your mandate to your glory by your spirit that indwells us. Lord, there are those who struggle with forgiving and releasing past hurt. Even now, Father, I pray that your spirit wells up in us and enables us to address those marbles that keep spilling over. Lord, I also want to lift up the broken, the, the divorcee possibly, the, the estranged maritally, and those, dear Father, who have gone through significant hurt relationally where they don't even want to trust anymore. And what we pray in this hour is that it might not be about trusting another person, but it might be about trusting you. Trusting you with our heart. Trusting you with the hurts and the pains that we've experienced. Trusting you to actually heal us so that we can go into relationship whole. Father, we pray, dear Father, for this house. Your word teaches us that they will know that we are Christians by our love. Yet, Father, oftentimes we struggle with loving your people the way in which you've called us. Shoot, we struggle loving those closest to us, let alone the world that you've challenged us to reach out and share your love with. So even now today, Lord, I pray that you empower us. I pray that we grab a hold of you and be strengthened by you to go forth in love as you've called us to love sacrificially to your glory. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we honor you. Lord, we give you praise. In Jesus' precious and matchless name we pray. Amen and amen and amen.